Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the 2018 Faith and Work Summit. My name is Lisa Slayton. I am the CEO of the Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation uh, and have been part of the steering committee for this event and just am thrilled to see such a full room. Uh, I am pleased to announce, it was whispered in my ear this morning, that with last minute registrations and walk-ups, we have exceeded the Dallas Summit and uh, so this is the largest summit so far. <laughs> We want to start our day uh, appropriately, and so it's my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Edmund Moy, who will be coming up. Uh, he, Ed, Ed is a, a, a past assistant, special assistant to the president, um, and was the, one of the directors of the U.S. Mint, and uh, a longtime friend and colleague in the faith and work movement. Uh, Ed, welcome. Thirty-nine years ago, I was a uh, graduate of the University of Wisconsin and a new Christian when a number of friends came to me and said, what are you going to do with the rest of your life now that you've committed it to Jesus Christ? And I said, well, I'm a new Christian. What are the options? And he said, well, we would encourage you to consider full-time Christian ministry. And I said, well, what is that? I'm a new Christian. I don't understand that language. And he said, well, you could become a pastor, a parachurch worker, a missionary. He said, well, what's the other option? Well, you can go into the workplace, and how you redeem that is share the gospel there, earn a lot of money to pay for the people who are in full-time Christian ministry. <laughs> Even in a young Christian's heart, that did not resonate. I read Genesis chapter 1, and it was, that message was contrary to what Genesis was saying. But in my Christian life, uh, for seven years, Virtually every Christian I talked to parroted that paradigm. And it wasn't until Pete Hammond of University Christian Fellowship, who started the marketplace movement within the university, invited me to speak, and I was with 3,000 like-minded individuals. And that's when I knew that I belonged. What does this movement mean to me? To paraphrase Shakespeare, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers and sisters. That's what this movement means to me. Can we go to the Lord in prayer? Thank you, Lord, for the gift of each other. Thank you for everyone that you've called to be here. We pray that during this time, you would give us the spirit of unity around your word, around you and our service to you with regards to work. Help us be an example to the disunity and divisiveness of uh, all that is going around us. We also pray that we would have the spirit of learning. So instead of talking past each other and talking at each other, that we would be here with open hearts and open minds to hear what you have to say about work. But most of all, Lord, we pray for your presence. We know that you've already answered that prayer because where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in our midst. And so we... Uh, pray that you would teach us, um, chide us, uh, move us in the right direction, but most of all, give us vision and hope in how to support each other as fellow travelers on this great journey that you've given us the privilege to be on. In Jesus' name, amen. And now David Gill is going to join us again uh, to honor two more pioneers in the faith and work movement. David, thank you. Good morning, everybody. We salute, first of all, Alice Matthews as a distinguished Faith at Work scholar, educator, broadcaster, and leader, especially, but not exclusively, but especially in challenging and empowering women to step out and flourish in their rightful, God-intended callings in the marketplace as well as in the church place. Alice earned her bachelor's degree at Bob Jones, her MA in clinical psychology at Michigan State, and a PhD in Theological and Religious Studies at the Iliff School of Theology in the University of Denver. Alice also studied French at the Sorbonne in Paris and spent 17 years serving churches in France and elsewhere in Europe. Alice served on the faculty of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary for 10 years 
and is now emeritus uh, Lois W. Bennett Distinguished Professor of Educational and Women's Ministries. She also served a term as Gordon Conwell's academic dean. From its beginnings in 2007, Alice has served as an editor, writer, and editorial board member for the Theo Theology of Work Project, helping to produce its comprehensive Theology of Work Bible Commentary. And she's also the contributing editor of two books in the Hendrickson Theology of Work series, Women and Work in the Old Testament and Women and Work in the New Testament. For 23 years, Alice co-hosted the daily radio program, Discovering the Word with Haddon Robinson, where they frequently discussed the meaning of our daily work as the topic came up in the scriptures. This program is broadcast still 600 times each day around the world. And Alice also served as dean and instructor for the online Christian university of uh, our daily bread. Alice's latest book is Gender Roles and the People of God, Rethinking What We Were Taught About Men and Women in the Church, just published last year. And she continues to write, to speak at conferences, and to guide doctoral student research. Her impact is summarized by one of her graduate students. Quote, Alice is the world's best mentor. She willingly shares her knowledge and expertise and encourages others to shine. Her support was invaluable to me when I was working on a project that was unrelated to her work or her department. She took time out of her insanely busy schedule to help me organize what I needed to do and feel confident that I would someday reach the end of it triumphantly. The manner in which she treats students as colleagues in learning is both rare and refreshing. Speaking personally, while casting no aspersions on my own deans at Gordon-Conwell, I have to say that one of my greatest disappointments was to arrive at Gordon-Conwell as a new faculty member there in 2010 and discover that Alice had recently moved on from the dean's official uh, responsibility. But this morning, Alice, who couldn't be with us, but she's still very much with us in this world, Alice, we salute you, we thank you, and we pray God will bless your leadership for years to come. Our second uh, pioneer is William Garrison, who lived from 1923 to 2004. William Garrison was a business, government, and church leader who invested much of his life mobilizing and equipping Christian disciples for the workplace. Bill earned his bachelor's degree in engineering from Texas Tech and his law degree from Southern Methodist. Although he did not have a formal theological education, those who knew him said he possessed one of the most insightful and penetrating theological minds in the 20th century. After working as a real estate attorney for a leading regional retailer, he formed the law firm of Cook and Garrison in 1960. He created Tarrant Title Insurance Company in 1973 and served as its president until 1985 when he became a Fort Worth City Council member serving in that role for six years. He also served as a trustee of Dallas Theological Seminary and on the local and national boards of Young Life, Search Ministries, and Bible Study Fellowship International. Throughout his career, Bill played a leading role in various Christian movements and organizations, advocating persistently for the value of work and the role of the laity. At the 1989 Lausanne Congress in Manila with Pete Hammond, another one of our great pioneers, he helped the Congress champion the centrality of work in the church's mission at a time when voices for the workplace were few and far between. His Congress paper, A Theology of the Laity, challenged the elevation of pastors and missionaries above other believers. The group he inspired and influenced has carried on within the Lausanne movement and will hold its first global workplace forum in 2019. The Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary awards one student each year a William Garrison Faith and Work Fellowship, which includes firsthand workplace training and a deep dive into the theology of work. And the current uh, William Garrison uh, Fellowship recipient is actually here at our conference working the Hendrickson exhibit out there if you want to say hello to him. Bill lived out his workplace faith by sharing the gospel and then discipling those who he led to Christ. At every opportunity, he spoke at churches and events, urging pastors and lay people to renounce the sacred secular divide and unleash the gifts of workplace Christians. In 1983, when the term layman was often 
used to describe Christians in the workplace, he co-authored the book, Layman, Look Up, God Has a Place for You. Our friend Bill Peel uh, recalls how he met Bill, Bar Bill Garrison in 1976, soon after he graduated from seminary and became associate pastor of a church where Garrison served as an elder. Six weeks into his new job, Mr. Garrison took Bill to lunch and said, Peel, you realize that God's heroes don't stand behind pulpits, don't you? Uh, Bill, fresh out of seminary, was a bit shocked. But over the next four years, Bill Peel says, uh, Mr. Garrison helped him to see God values work more than just as a platform for evangelism, although it is that, more than just for the income it produces to support those doing uh, church turf-based work, but as genuine worship and service to God in itself. So this morning, Lord, we thank you for our brother Bill Garrison's life and leadership. We honor his legacy, and we pray that it will continue to live on among many of us. Thank you, David. It is true that we do indeed in movements always stand on the shoulders of those who went before us, and so it's just right and fitting that we honor these pioneers. Um, I just want to thank this morning uh, the Center for Faith and Work at Letourneau University. They're our sponsor for this portion of the summit. Uh, they hosted the summit down in Dallas in 2016. I, I see lots of faces of folks who were there, um, which was a wonderful event. Uh, the center was launched in, in 2010 to perpetuate the legacy of the university founder, R.G. Letourneau, whose business-building giant earth-moving machines changed an industry landscape in the 20th century. This, this business was imbued with a, a robust theology of work and economics, and that DNA lives on in the university that bears his name. We're most grateful to the Center for Faith and Work in Letourneau and our good friend Bill Peel for their ongoing commitment to the summit. So I'm very excited about the topic that we're going to touch base on this morning, mostly because I, I am in a steep learning curve, and I think you'll find uh, that, that you are as well. Um, <clears throat> this idea, the disruption of work, uh, that's going on. There's a lot of conversation about it. Tons has been published. Um, I feel like I'm just at the front end of trying to understand it. Uh, as I said, I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, and so we have, we have a, a many things that we can claim uh, fame around, but one of them is that uh, in Pittsburgh, the Uber self-driving car, the autonomous Uber self-driving taxi was first launched in Pittsburgh, and the day that it started, I got texts and emails from about four people saying, can you send me a picture of yourself in an Uber self-driving vehicle, which I've not done yet, by the way. Um, I, I did have one photoshopped just for the purpose of, of, of sending it to someone, but I've not actually done it. By the way, they do still have humans in them, just so you know. They haven't totally gone autonomous. Um, but there's a lot of things out there. The artificial, you know, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence, machine learning, the gig economy. It seems like we're being bombarded with information about these new technologies and how they're disrupting the world of work. And actually, many of them are not new. They've been going on and are already embedded in the ways that we do work, whether we believe it or not. How many of you have one of these? Right? There it is, right? The, many of these technologies are always present. I heard, I think it was this week, I read an article uh, or a post around, um, and we do have someone here from Amazon, so he may be able to verify this, that there's work being done uh, on things like Alexa and Siri to develop emotional intelligence and, and empathy capacities so that when they respond to our questions, they're responding with a more human response. On the one hand, that's Fabulous. On the other hand, it's a little frightening, right? So, so how do we deal with this? How do we as Christians think about this? And for those of us that are working and discipling people, how do we help them process this? And what are the implications of it? There's a lot of fear and anxiety that we're going to be, that jobs are going to be replaced, that there will be no more human truck drivers and, and things like that. And when is that going to happen? And what's the date? And how can we predict? And I don't think that's necessarily the most useful way to approach this. So we're going to spend a little time this morning hearing from three people uh, who have been thinking about this and working at it uh, quite diligently um, to help us think through how we engage this with a Christian mind, and more than a Christian mind, with a Christian heart and gospel wisdom and grace. I'm, I'm really excited to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Philip Lorish, um, who's been thinking about this and writing about it and speaking about it for several years. Philip is uh, the Director of Cultural Research at Praxis Labs. He also serves as a fellow 
fellow at the Institute for Advanced Cultural Studies at the University of Virginia. He's highly credentialed with a bachelor's in philosophy from Furman, a master's in philosophy in theology from Oxford, and a PhD in theology, ethics, and culture from the University of Virginia. He lives in Charlottesville with his family. Please welcome Philip Lorsch to the stage. Morning, everybody. I'm uh, really glad to be with you and uh, grateful to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. So um, I'm going to start, let's see, there we go. I'm going to start uh, in a place where academics rarely start, with, which is the emotions. Um, and if you are anything like me, uh, the mere mention of words like disruption and work um, in the same sentence creates a kind of low-level uh, anxiety or sense of powerlessness, a sense that someone somewhere is doing something to me and uh, I don't know what they're doing, but it feels important. Um, and I wanna tell you that I feel that way too. Lots of times when I open up a new book delivered to me by Amazon or a new tab that I read on my iPad, I get the sense that there's a lot of stuff happening, as Lisa mentioned. Um, and my sense of anxiety does not go away when I do this. Um, when I go and start Googling things. Um, sometimes I find stuff like this, three recent pieces. Um, one that Amazon's gonna consider opening cashierless stores. Another that Flippy, which is actually pretty cool, uh, has started to flip hamburgers in California. Where else would it be, of course? Um, and then the third, that Uber's self-driving truck has made its first delivery, actually in 2016, so that's a little old now. Um, 50,000 beers, Bud Light, I'm told. Um, so put the beer in quotes. But, um, <laughs> so retail, retail, food services, trucking, Perhaps these are not your chosen career. Perhaps these are not the things that you would desire your children to do. Um, but all three are being reconfigured as we speak. Take the most disgust, uh, disgust of these, truck driving, which Lisa already mentioned. Um, roughly three million people in this country, mostly men with little college education, drive long haul trucks for a living. And estimates suggest that twice that many folks, up to seven million, are employed in the set of services truckers use while on the road, truck stops and the like. In the state of Nebraska, one in 12 workers work in either trucking, moving, or an adjacent field, one in 12. And in the future, uh, moving stuff around is still going to happen, and it won't just be beer runs, um, but rather we will likely have sophisticated forms of moving stuff that could in time make our highways more safe, about 4,000 people a year die in uh, accidents with tractor trailers. Uh, in time, we could be more safe, and yet we may put a lot of folks out of work. So I'm not an economist nor a technologist. I don't employ anybody. I work with lots of people who do, uh, and I do not have an all access pass to the future. My main task today is neither dystopian nor utopian. I don't want to excite you or get you scared. I want to diagnose, which is always an act of demystification. I want to see if we can demystify this thing a little bit. And I do this as an ethicist who works with entrepreneurs. This means I claim no further expertise than being able to read and spending lots of time doing so. If people like me are clinicians at anything, uh, we've honed the skills of evaluating ideas. And my own vocation is to do that work with entrepreneurs whose vocations are to give shape to the world that is to come. So I wanna take up this question of the disruption of work in three phases. Here's the plan of attack. What's happened, what may happen, and what could we, this group, do? So in and this is, the this is the graphic you'll get accustomed to. It's not great, but it works. So uh, there are other dates that we could use. There are ways we could be more precise. But what I want to do is look at what's happened 
in a big story over the last hundred years, in a, another story over the last 50, and then in the last 10, and I'm going to spend a good bit of time on that story, and then what may happen in the next 10, the next 50, and spoiler alert, in the next 100, I don't know, so I don't have anything there. Um, but let's do it, uh, let's do it. So what has happened? The big story over the last hundred years is what I would call the, the story of a, move, a movement from overcoming scarcity to managing abundance. So what do I mean by this? By this I mean to point to the undeniable power of the set of technologies and financial revolutions that have unlocked and distributed massive amounts of wealth across the modern world. Now, it's been unequally distributed, but it has been created. The easiest and best way to describe the economic activity of the last hundred years is simply with the story of what I'll call the, the modern story of more. More productivity, more consumption, more wealth, and crucially, more waste. For all its booms and busts and the externalities that we're dealing with, the big economic story of the 20th century is just more. My favorite example of this comes, and I've tried to select Chicago examples for you guys, uh, comes from uh, the, the enigmatic and wonderful economist, Chicago economist Robert Fogel, who died in 2013. In his uh, 1993 Nobel Prize Award speech, he previewed what would become a book with the scintillating title of, quote, The Escape from Hunger and Premature Death, 1700 to 2100. Full of graphs and hard data from physical records, Fogel's project was to tell the modern story of more through the human body, and yes, I do mean the human body. In Fogel's telling, all of the hockey stick graphs you may have seen about GDP or global productivity or whatever else, those, those graphs only tell part of the story. Those graphs need to be complemented by the scientific fact that the site of the most dramatic growth in the 20th century is actually our height and weight. Through a series of technological developments that increase the caloric density of food and food stuff, human beings have nearly doubled their lifespans and increased their body size by about 50% in the Western world. Beyond breakthroughs in farming and food processing, this is also complemented by developments in personal hygiene, building design, medical breakthroughs like immunizations, and widespread access to antibiotics. So none of those developments insulate us from tragedy or ill fortune. We're all going to get sick and die. But Focal's point is largely right and largely ignored, and that is this, that the most common sources of our decline now have to do with our excesses rather than our lacks. In this way, the obesity crisis is both a real crisis and an achievement. <laughs> We've shifted, in, in other words, from a world of overcoming scarcity to one where we're managing our abundance and often not doing it well. So if you need further proof of that and you don't like my obesity example, take a look at this. This is the uh, Cupertino headquarters of Apple, which is either complete or nearly complete. The cost of this is $5 billion estimated. Uh, it was an obsession of Steve Jobs before he died. Uh, and Apple makes enough money to produce this in about seven and a half weeks. Um, we live in a world marked by amazing abundance. Um, we have largely solved a number of problems regarding scarcity, and we live in a world of abundance. That's the big story of more. How about in the last 50 years? I would call this the shift from security to flexibility, and here we'll talk about the nature of work more directly. So in recent years, lots of folks have sought to put their finger on the shift I'm describing as the movement from security to flexibility. So during the post-war period, workers of all kinds made a, an exchange with their employers. They, they traded their fidelity for security, their daily labor for the tacit promise of stability. 
whether it be in the professions or the trades, if a worker was minimally competent, once he or she, but mostly he, was credentialed and brought into an organization at an entry-level position, there was discernible and obvious, a discernible and obvious path for growth, and crucially, the presumption of continued employment. This meant that the goal of emerging adulthood was obtaining a job, not retaining a job. All the credentialing agents of emerging adulthood culminated in establishing a career. There was sweat for the worker, to be sure, but for the blue-collar and white-collar worker alike, sweat was exchanged for security. As Lewis Hyman of Cornell has put it, the jobs may have been repetitive, but so were the paychecks. This bargain of sweat for security is either in the process of being called off or has been called off altogether. What has taken its place? It appears that the company man has become the contingent worker. Now hear me correctly, a, a lot of people still work in standard work arrangements, 40 hours, health insurance, and the like, but most of our recent growth in job markets has been in contingent or non-standard work arrangements. This, this, was, this came home in a recent paper by Lawrence Katz and Alan Kruger called The Rise and Nature of Alternative Work Arrangements in the U.S. from 1995 to 2015. And they described what we often now call as the 1099 economy, um, where em employees are not really employees, but are contingent laborers, even in sort of legacy organizations. So this has lowered the expectation of both employers and employees. So this comes from Reed Hoffman's uh, important piece called Tours of Duty. And he says, mutual investment was implicit in the old lifetime employment compact. Because both sides expected the relationship to be permanent, both sides were willing to invest in it. Companies provided training, advancement, and an unspoken guarantee of employment, while employees provided loyalty and a moderation of wage demands. The new compact acknowledges the probable impermanence of the relationship, yet seeks to build trust and investment anyway. Instead of entering into strict bonds of loyalty, both sides seek the mutual benefits of alliance. That's effectively the ethos of LinkedIn, where social media and basically hiring practices are merged, right? We have exchanged security for flexibility, which for many people looks like insecurity. Um, and the results of this trade are not fully in yet. We don't know how this is going to go. So, movement three. I think. The platform revolution, from product to platform. Let's go ahead and address the third and most recent shift, namely the shift from product to platform. On some level, this is the easiest to intuit, but the least or the most difficult to conceptualize because, remember, that iPhone that Lisa held up is, not, is barely 10 years old. To its boosters, the platform revolution unlocks unforeseen economic value that's always been present in our everyday lives, but we've never known how to access. This is why uh, you hear in Silicon Valley a consistent phrase of, this new company is like Airbnb for X, or like Uber for Y. It's the same formula because it's the same thing. The platform has replaced the product somehow. This is exemplified in the, uh, well, and it looks like this. What platforms promise is access without ownership and networks without hierarchy. That's what, it is, that's what the platform does. And the famous story that um, uh, runs around the sharing economy is the story of the drill, right? Which is most people own drills that have the resources to do so. But what you actually want is not the drill, but the hole. And if there's a way to get the hole without the drill uh, through access without ownership and networks without hierarchy, that's what a platform facilitates. And this does a lot for our economy, and we're not, I'm not really sure how it's all gonna play out. The biggest thing that it does is it places scale, understood in a particular type of way, at the center of 
new, the new economy and at the center of the new companies that are being built. So scale for platform companies is not about the reach of a product as much as it is about the amount of engagement we can get with the least amount of employees and, and the, least, the, the leanest possible team. So this became clear to me when I was interviewing the product lead of a major tech company in Silicon Valley who was boasting to me about the fact that they were on track to reach a billion users in the near future. What he, this particular person was most excited about was that they were doing that with an engineering team of somewhere between 150 and 200 folks. That's the power of scale, he told me, and that's the great power of a tech-forward business model. So as far as the disruption of work goes, I think that's a pretty accurate but clearly not comprehensive account of where we are, the world you woke up in. These three movements are stacked upon each other, and they give us a sense of the modern work. Of modern work. It's about managing abundance, particularly in the knowledge economy. It's fundamentally committed to a idea of alliance at the center of the relationship between employee and employer. And it's increasingly platform-based. So now, what may happen next? And here we can go quick, because I don't know. <laughs> in my, by my lights, the shift in the next 10 years will be a fairly dramatic acceleration of the movement from labor to labor. The return, um, to return to some of the examples brought up at the beginning, what we will see more and more of in the next 10 years is a fundamental reconfiguration of the relationship of human work to work more generally. And this is going to be driven by lots of different forms of innovation, including artificial intelligence. So as soon as artificial intelligence is uttered, we have to be very clear about what we mean. Most sharp technologists, by my lights, and industry analysts recognize that incorporating new forms of AI into everyday work, which we'll hear about in a little bit, will automate certain features of our work lives before they colonize our jobs as a whole, if they do at all. So consider trucks for just a minute, again. Um, it'd be kind of nice if a truck driver who was tired driving across Kansas could take a 30-minute nap. Uh, and everybody would understand that uh, the truck would keep moving, um, it, things would move safely, and when said truck driver was rested, he or she could take back over the wheel. Uh, that's probably the first phase. The next phase would be if we could tie uh, additional trucks to create a fleet of trucks, fl trucks that could um, use sensors to notice um, how the truck in front was moving, create a certain type of space, so you could efficiently move more freight with fewer people. Um, the, the idea then would be that maybe you can automate out of a human being in the cab at all at a certain point, but my sense is, at this point, that's fairly prospective. Um, and what's going to happen is not overnight truck drivers are just going to end. It's that there's going to be a sort of consistent um, but steady uh, creep of technology into forms of everyday life and everyday work such that 10 years from now things will look radically different but we won't have noticed. So here's some data from May of 2017 from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and two quotes. One from the McKinsey Global Institute. So they suggested, and this is kind of old now, it's 2016, about 60% of all jobs have at least 30% of activities that are technically automatable based on technologies available today. Andrew Yang has said that, yeah, the numbers have been telling a story for a while now that we've been ignoring. Automation is accelerating to a point where it will soon threaten our social fabric and way of life. So look at these industries and just think to yourself, what features of these jobs uh, could be automated and potentially will be automated and recognize that all of these are very real people. So it's true that as some industries trend downward, it's all, others will emerge. There's lots of talk of the pink collar jobs in healthcare that may, may take some of these jobs that we may lose. 
And the jobs that emerge may, in time, employ as many people as the industries they replace. But that's just the issue. They may do so in time. The rate of technological unemployment, and crucially, the willingness of big corporations to use the eventual downturn in our economy whenever it happens, to make significant alterations to the labor force, means that the threats to the jobs many people currently have is more severe than the promise of retraining and reemployment. This will put massive stress, this will put massive stress on our already stressed out social contract, paving the way for the second shift I see, namely the shift from worker to citizen. And here, the further out we get, the more we're speculating, the more I'm speculating. But within the discussions of, future of the future of work, you don't have to go very far to find robust debates about the need for a new social contract. The premise of that new social contract is fairly straightforward and I think about right. It says, look, within a world of overcoming scarcity, the idea that we are connected to the resources required for a minimally decent life, that we connect that need with the fact of having a job made some sense. But that's not really the world we live in anymore. We don't really have a production problem now. And with the increased efficiencies of machines, we're likely to continue to raise productivity levels while employing fewer and fewer people. So what we need is not to place employment at the center of our social contract, wherein having a good job is the prerequisite for a minimally decent life. Rather, it's citizenship, something like membership in a community that grounds the claim to the resources we need. And this is the logic behind proposals like the universal basic income, which, you should know, have, um, ha has boosters on both sides of the political and social divide. So on my shelf, you see Charles Murray's In Our Hands, next to Andy Stern, the former president of the, the country's larger, largest labor union, his book, Raising the Floor. And those two people don't typically advocate similar policies. Neither do Milton Friedman and Martin Luther King who both advocated some version of a universal basic income. So in the next 50 years, I think we're going to experience a dramatic shift from this, our central form of political identity being worker to citizen. And I really don't know what happens after that. So what can we do? I have uh, three things to say briefly. And then I'll lean on my colleagues to fix any messes I've made. Uh, so, I was once giving a presentation to this effect in front of some employers, and they asked me this question, what should we do? And I gave a long-winded answer that I can't really remember. And uh, the person who asked the question said, that's great, Philip, but I thought it would be good to start by asking if we could be better employers. And I thought, that sounds about right. Yes, that's exactly what you should do. Um, Employers have immense power, and those of you who employ people have immense power to actually express a certain type of love and affection for the folks you employ, who are feeling like they are in incredibly precarious, precarious positions. Why? Because they are. Um, employers can pay attention to what's the nature of a good job and how can they preserve those good jobs for uh, the people that they employ. And here I would the good jobs thesis is, a, is riffing off of Zenep Tom of MIT's business school, who says that the main things employers desire um, is a certain type of meaningful decision making over their workplaces and what they do, a certain type of flexibility across a company where they can learn a number of different skills, and a certain amount of slack within their jobs where they can, uh, they can begin to grow and express higher, um, express higher desires for what their future may be. If you employ people, you can do that. But let's move on. Oh, whoops, let's not move on. Uh, ah. What about conveners, which I take a number of you to be? Here I'd say two things. In the first place, we should be cr thinking critically about the particular vulnerabilities of your locality, your municipality, where you live. Do you know how the major employers in your city are thinking about the trends we've identified? Do you know what they offer their employees? Do you know who the winners and losers in the new economy 
may be in your city and what the winners are going to be tempted to do and what the losers need. On a broader level, though, I would encourage folks who are, have convening power to think about the nature of community resilience um, and what it w is going to take for dramatic shifts within a municipality or within, within the workforce of a municipality, what's it gonna take for a society to survive? And here I would suggest an, a really fascinating book um, by another Chicago native, Eric Kleinenberg, called Heat Wave, and a recent one called Palaces of the People, that evaluates um, a heat wave in 1995 here in Chicago and the particular um, discrepancies between neighborhoods. So in this one week in Chicago in 1995, 700 people more than normal died from heat-related activities. And the question is, among statistically similar and demographically similar neighborhoods, why was it the case that some areas had more deaths than others? Some, some areas were more resilient than others. And he, he points to this notion of social infrastructure, which is really important. Uh, it's not social ties, it's not social capital, but the types of uh, everyday uh, human interactions that people have that really matter in moments of catastrophe, <laughs> uh, where you can check in on neighbors and, and get a sense of how they're doing. And I would suggest that uh, we need to do an audit of the social infrastructure of your municipality to see who's vulnerable and how they can be assisted. And then finally, I would say the good society thesis, what we as citizens can do. And this is obviously difficult um, because it has to do with the nature of <laughs> what sort of society we would like to live in. So I have one thing to leave you with, which is, that we should recognize in these discussions when we're speaking in the passive voice, and we should resist the temptation to do so. The economic order that we are building is just that, something that we are building. This means that even though we have different levels of power in the building of that order, we are still agents with very real powers, not least the powers of our voices and our wallets. Yet right now we are, as Marilyn Robinson has put it in a different context, fundamentally marked by fear, which as she says, is not a Christian habit of mind. So although I've not, I'm no real settled insight as to what the shape of the good society should be in a world of radically transformed work, I am certain that we will not discern the shape of that, of that world if we give in to wide, a widespread sense of resignation and fatalism. This should be obvious to us, a people who literally confess that he who died was raised again. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for offering some perspective this morning and uh, perhaps some new ways of thinking about how we approach this. Um, we do want to get practical, um, and so we're going to build on what Philip has done, and I'm pleased to invite to the stage uh, first Trip Parker. Um, Trip works for Amazon uh, and in the Alexa Health and Wellness Group currently, where he can only share that he's working on new products he's not allowed to talk about yet. So maybe we'll get a little hint from him this morning. He, uh, he graduated from Duke with majors in electrical and computer engineering, computer science and philosophy. He's worked in the artificial intelligence space and machine learning in Seattle for companies uh, such as Microsoft as well as Amazon. He also has studied biblical and systematic theology. And so he brings those two things together to us this morning to bring perhaps a biblical pers perspective on how this learning is Im going to impact, already is impacting our lives. Following trip, Missy Wallace will come up. Uh, Missy spent 20 years in the corporate and nonprofit sector, and as she has shared with me many times, she realized she was saddled with a terrible theology around work, and, and so therefore launched the Nashville Institute for Faith and Work um, to, to, for her own learning as well as for those in her community. She has experience at Boston Consulting Group, Time Warner, and Bank of America, and brings a unique perspective to, to kind of bridge the sacred-secular divide across the business sector in, into our everyday Christian lives. She lives with her husband, Paul, their three children, and two Labradoodles in Nashville. So welcome, Trip to the stage.
Okay, so I'm going to go as fast as I can through this because I only have 10 minutes. Um, I want to talk about artificial intelligence, what it is, um, what's it good at, is it going to take all the jobs, and who's going to be affected. Philip, uh, in the previous talk, um, did talk about, uh, he gave you three examples, cashierless stores, burger flipping, and trucks. And that's kind of how we all think about artificial intelligence and the kinds of things that's going to be uh, jobs that are going to be replacing. I'm here to disabuse you of that notion. Um, it's, it's a lot scarier than that. <laughs> um, in my slides got messed up. So first, let's talk about artificial intelligence. What is it? Um, in particular, people always ask me, what's the difference between it and like normal code, right? So normal code, you, you might have heard the term algorithm, and that's just a fancy name for a set of instructions to complete a task. So whenever you uh, cook and you follow some directions, you're following an algorithm, right? Computer code is just a set of algorithms, and it's just written in a different language than the one you speak, but it is an algorithm. That's normal computer code, and most problems that we solve with computers are solved using just very basic set of instructions and, and algorithms layered on top of each other. So this presents a problem, and this is called Polanyi's paradox. Polanyi was a philosopher. And what Polanyi pointed out was, we know more than we can tell. You understand things that you can't actually write down. A good example would be, what does your mother look like, right? If I were to give you a thousand, if I, you're going to give me a thousand people and you said, I said, write down how I'm going to tell which one is your mom, you would actually really struggle with that. It's hard. Emotion classification, which I can neither confirm nor deny that Amazon is working on, um, is another one. How do you tell if someone's happy or sad? You would really struggle to come give me an algorithm for figuring that out, a set of instructions to tell, yes, this person is definitely sad. This person is definitely happy. So I can't just write a simple algorithm for that, but we try to solve this problem. Another example that I like to use is how can you tell the difference between a dog and a wolf? If you were really to think about it and try and write down, what's the difference? Someone who's never seen either of them, how could they tell? You would really struggle with that. Enter artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is essentially a set of algorithms, it's a mathematical system that establishes patterns between inputs and outputs. So I give an AI a bunch of pictures of wolves and a bunch of pictures of dogs, and it establishes patterns in the data to say, oh, I, I kind of understand how to tell a wolf from a dog. But notice I, didn't, I never described any of this. I just gave it input and a correct output over and over and over again, and it figured out the mathematical correlations, and I don't even necessarily know how. This is a real example, and it's kind of a famous one in early machine learning that we fed a bunch of pictures to, of wolves and dogs, and we said, okay, how, you, how can you figure the, out the difference? And eventually the AI started getting it right. And we're like, great, we figured something out. Um, well, it turns out that what it was looking for was a very particular thing, and that's it noticed that people like to take pictures of wolves when they're standing on snow. <laughs> and so, you could give it that, and it'd be like, yeah, that's totally a wolf. <laughs> OK, so what's it good at? Cognitive repetition. Cognitive repetition. Anything that is cognitively repetitive, it's good at establishing patterns. Notice I didn't say simple, though. When I say cognitively repetitive, it doesn't mean simple at all. Arithmetic is cognitively repetitive and fairly simple. Calculus is cognitively repetitive and complicated. So don't think, oh, something as easy as burger flipping. Think radiology. If you were to list all the things that a radiologist does, there's something like 27 unique tasks that it has to do, that a radiologist might have to do. One of them is interpreting images that come out of an MRI. One of them is producing a patient plan for treating this illness. These are cognitively repetitive. There's a right way to do it. It's hard to write down exactly how to do that. And that's why we make doctors go to residency and all this kind of stuff to learn over time. There's no algorithm really for it, but it is cognitively repetitive. So stop thinking about jobs and start thinking about tasks. What are the tasks that make up all the jobs? 
accountants, lots of things are cognitively repetitive. Lawyers, lots of things. Doctors, nurses, not just truck drivers. So is it going to eliminate all the jobs? I think, my slides got messed up. Um, I think shredding versus eliminating is probably a better way of looking at this. And so this was a, an article in Foreign Affairs that asked, will humans go the way of horses? In 1908, Ford released the Model T. There were something like 20 million horses in the United States, 100 million people, so a horse for every five people. 50 years later, there were four and a half million horses for 180 million people, so a horse for every 20. Why? Because we replaced a lot of the tasks that we normally had horses for with other things. Other technology did it. This picture is a picture of a fire brigade. This is a fire truck. We obviously do not use horses for this task anymore. It's not that we don't have horses, we still have horses. We just don't use them for these things anymore. So that's a good way of thinking about it. What it might, I'm not saying there's not gonna be accountants or doctors or lawyers. What I'm saying is there will be a lot fewer of them. What used to be able to be done with five accountants can be done with one because we're going to automate a lot of their tasks. It's gonna be a lot easier. This leads to a second order problem. Not only do we have four accountants out of work, the one accountant that's left has reduced demand for his or her job. We don't need them as much. Most of it's automated. There's more competition for that job. What does that do? It drives down wages. So you might think, oh, well, that's fine. I'm one of the best accountants in the world, and that's good, so maybe you'll be one of the ones standing. You'll make less, too. Your wages go down. It's not just the elimination of jobs. It's the effect on wages, and that's something we've really, really seen in the 20th century. This has happened for people. In the 20th century, we reduced agriculture jobs by something like 95%. 5% of people are farmers now compared to the start of the 20th century. We also provide food for three times as many people and cheaper. So what does that mean? It means the world's getting a lot, the world's getting a lot richer, a lot more efficient. I agree, we need to think about this as how do we manage abundance, but we need to be really, really sober about who's going to be affected by this. So this chart was produced by um, some economists and computer scientists at MIT. Um, they developed what they called a SML score, suitable for machine learning. So how many jobs are there and how many different tasks make up all those jobs and are they cognitively repetitive? Is it something that we can build an AI to actually solve? That's the Y axis. X axis is wages. That's the wage percentile. Farther to the right, the richer you are, it's radiologists, farther to the left, those are the burger flippers. Okay? Notice there's no clustering there. Notice how even it is across the board. It's not just truck drivers, it's not just burger flippers. It is accountants and lawyers and doctors and nurses. So, in summary, the world is about to get a lot richer, a lot faster than it ever has been. That is going to really, really disrupt the job market. It's gonna be great or terrible, depending on what we do with that. We're gonna have a lot more resources to solve this problem than we've ever had before. But it is a problem. And like Einstein said, you can't solve a problem that you created using the same kind of thinking that produced it. The church is uniquely positioned, and I'll close with this, and Missy will follow up on it. The church does not just view people as employees, as salaries. And by the church, I don't mean the four walls, and I don't mean the denomination, I mean us. You're not just an employee, you're not just a salary, you're not just a cost to me. You're also not a vote for me to buy. So it's not just the employers, it's also the politics. You're not just a vote, you're an image bearer. And that's why we really, really need to take this seriously. We really need to think about how it affects us. What is the relationship like with the people that are going to be affected and how do we play a part in taking this abundance and making it available to everybody? Thank you.
So my role is to talk about the context of someone leading a faith and work network and how we're trying to think about it for our constituencies and for the church. And um, I'm not a futurist. I'm not an academician. Um, I'm not a CEO of a business. I'm not a um, degreed theologian. So I thought, what, is, what am I going to bring to this discussion? But what I do think I can bring is someone that's in the trenches working practically with workers and think about how do we, how do we move forward. Like perhaps many of you, I've kept abreast of these trends and read occasional articles on these trends, but somehow went back and forth between this is too abstract, I don't know what to do with it, or this is too scary, and so I can't, can't take it in. And when I really uh, started thinking differently is when I met Ellie. Um, Ellie, I didn't actually meet her, but Ellie, I read an article about Ellie. Ellie is actually a chat bot being tested at USC. And through Ellie's welcoming and gentle, soft, encouraging voice, her probing question, and her non-judgmental way, Ellie has been shown to pick up depression and PTSD at a rate higher than a therapist in test at USC. And so while Ellie isn't massively overhauling the therapy industry yet, the fact that that, that would have been an industry that I would have thought would be most unlikely to be replaced by something like Ellie the Robot. And so it really caught my attention. And another thing that caught my attention just last week, um, warning, this is rated PG-13, if not RRX, um, Houston just recently, a, a town outside of Houston just had to go to some means to prevent the opening of a robot brothel that was scheduled to open this month in Houston. And so areas that we would never have imagined could be automated are perhaps being automated. So my organization, it's a typical faith and work organization um, in the city of Nashville. We're three and a half years old. We are launched out of a church, but we are city facing. 70% of our constituents come from 20 plus churches um, and we do classes and year-long intensive forums, entrepreneur groups, and we've begun partnering with um, Made to Flourish um, for pastor education, and we're starting to work in some career counseling as well. Um, and so my, my context is, how am I thinking about all these people that we serve? How are we talking about the future of work? So one thing I did to figure out um, where people in our faith-based industry are thinking is I sent out a small four-question survey. I sent it to pastors and faith and work leaders. Um, very sh Four questions, very small sample size, U.S. only, and an incredible bias because my networks that I sent this through are people that are working in the faith and work industry. So you would think more than anyone that the people I sent this, question, this questionnaire to would be thinking about the disruption in the future of work. First question I asked, how well informed are you about the significant changes predicted in the workforce? Um, almost 80% of pastors and faith-based leaders were neutral to uninformed about the future of the workforce. Um, Less than 6% say that we're highly informed. Do you believe the changes will impact your main constituencies in the next five years? 75% said yes or maybe. Are you doing things to prepare for the issues that may impact your constituencies due to the changing nature of the workforce? 77% said no. So 80% of us um, agree that it is coming. 80% of us uh, don't know much about it and 80% of us are doing nothing. Um, so it is time for us to engage. <laughs> um, we need to understand the trends. We need to engage in conversations about the Christocentricity of it. We need to understand our immediate city contexts by industry, by chance of disruption, by tasks. We need to assess our particular constituency's forecasted needs and ability to offer things and we need to assess opportunities to provide and partner. Um, Nashville's about 1.8 million people. We're supposed to double by the year 2030. We're the state capital. We're the largest MSA in Tennessee. Our main industries are music, healthcare, higher education, manufacturing, government, and hospitality. Um, you may or may not know we've been 
a lot of buzz around Nashville. We have a really good PR agent or something, but a whole lot of buzz around Nashville. We've been called the it city. We've been called the third coast. We're the seventh fastest growing in adding jobs in the nation, but um, we are the sixth most segregated city in the nation. Our ability to move people out of poverty into a different socioeconomic bracket, um, we are worse than 88, um, well, let me phrase that differently. Only 12% of counties in the country um, do this worse than we do. So we're in the bottom 13% of moving people out of poverty despite all this growth, and our Brookings Institute of Prosperity numbers are falling. So while we're growing and we're adding all these jobs, we're actually, um, we have an, under, an underbelly as well. So I've been um, getting some reports, and our state economic bureau has done some reporting for the state, and I know you can't see this, but I think it's um, illustrative of, you can look at all kinds of jobs, and you can look at which jobs have greater than 70% of chance of disruption. And like my other two colleagues have mentioned, I expected things like waitresses, Amazon fulfillment type jobs, truck workers. I did not expect accountants, bookkeepers, lawyers, radiologists, pharmacy technicians. Um, and you can start to understand in your state, in your city, how many people are holding these jobs that have a great percent of disruption. And so I did that, or I, I used somebody else's data to do that. And I started to put people into buckets. So there's the probably gonna stay employed bucket, there's the uh, probably going to be unemployed, but perhaps retrainable bucket. And then there's the unemployed, what are we going to do with these people, not retrainable bucket. And um, this is not an exact science. But over the next few years, roughly 800,000 Nashville jobs are expected to fall into the unemployed or the possibly retrainable bucket. That is an enormous number, and potentially 35% of our wages. So then my next step is to try to figure out who, who are we interacting with? What is that? How does that impact our constituencies? And what are, what are our opportunities and responsibilities in that? And so one thing that I have been thinking about is how do you think about the needs of these various buckets? And so if we have the unemployed bucket, those people are going to have great need for provision, identity, who am I without a job? What was I created for? Time. What in the world do I do with my time if I can't find more work? Community. I've now been isolated. Those that are retrainable have some of the same um, concerns as well. They have um, provision, um, financial planning, identity, talent and ability. How do they understand their talents and abilities? Job counseling and education. Again, community. And those that are in the employed bucket, you know, the, they're in the land of milk and honey. Well, we've got to help them with the idolatry of power, success, stewarding, asset, and affluence, and again, community, with potentially significantly increasing polarity of income. Now, here's the good news. Fear, provision, community, identity, meeting. The church has been doing a good job answering these questions for a couple thousand years. So this is great but only in the context of baseline needs being met. So if you think of Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, if people are hungry, if they don't have homes in their head, if they're desperate, it's hard, to, it's hard to have these conversations. So what can we do now, soon, and later? I think now we need to open our minds to things that we haven't thought about. We need to prepare, we need to change, partner, and support. So on opening our mind, we need to consider the theology of work, we need to research trends, understand the expectations in your city state, send teams and gatherings out to things in your city, and I highly recommend you expand your mind around universal basic income, around social credits. Social credits is a concept of if you're spending your time volunteering, um, you can be, um, receive credits that you can barter economically with, things like guilds to learn new jobs. Soon, um, really trying to understand your constituencies, your buckets, and ways you can give or need to receive these retooling, these ability assessments, educational se sessions, etc. And later, how are we actually going to support wealth redistribution models? How are we actually going to think about time redistribution models? 
what are our economic models going to be? If we lose 40% of people tithing into our churches, what's going to happen to that? What city partnerships can we forge to make this work happen? In 1927, Secretary of State Davis was talking, um, giving a speech, and some people were trying to slow down the Industrial Revolution, and he was saying the progress cannot stop, we must keep going. Um, he said, but we cannot afford the human and business waste of scrapping men. The new invention we need is a way of caring for this fellow made temporarily jobless. When a man loses a job, we all lose something. Our national efficiency is not what it should be unless we stop that loss. So I think there's, um, that, that remains incredibly relevant to us today. Um, so are we going to get caught behind this radical upheaval predicted? What do we do about the income polarity? How are people provided for? What is the purpose of work? And what are we going to do if there is not enough traditional work to go around during this transition? And can a system emerge that can be extremely market-driven and extremely socially driven at once? That might be a, a really new way of thinking. So I just end with, um, you know, do not fear. It's a command over and over in the Bible. In Psalm 3, 8, 3 through 9, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? With that, I close and thank you. So we're going to give you a few minutes now to talk at your tables uh, and start putting your questions into the Slido app, and uh, uh, we'll be back up with the panel to begin to respond to those questions. Just take a few minutes to do that now, and we'll be back up shortly. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. Um, thank you for your questions. So let me start with the first question. Thank you. Ah, beautiful. I know there's a lot of discussion around this, and we're going to take a few minutes now to dive into some of your questions. Know that there is a Q&A that will follow up uh, with, all, with all of our speakers uh, directly following this as one of the workshop options, as well as this, the speakers from last night. So as you're thinking about what workshop you want to go to at the 11 o'clock time slot, know that you can dig in a little deeper with our three wonderful uh, speakers this morning. So the first question I want to touch on, I have the power of Slido, so I get to choose which questions. It's, it's, it's kind of a moment of, like, I don't get power like this very often. Um, what specific theological doctrine or insight do our speakers believe theologians should be working on to help with work disruption? How would you want to answer that? I'll start with you, Philip, down at the end. <laughs> yeah, what, what specific theological doctrine or insight do our speakers believe theologians should be working on to help with work disruption? Okay. Uh, I, how about I say something slightly controversial and direct, which is I think it's um, I think this room needs to reconfigure and rethink its use of the term dignity. Mm. Uh, and here's what I'll say: um, human beings have dignity, uh, not by dint of their work. I understand that in this world um, we want to say that work has dignity, whatever it is, uh, whether you're flipping burgers or uh, doing, caring for children or, um, I don't know, uh, writing new algorithms. Um, I believe that's true, but I think we conflate really quickly um, uh, the, the activity of working and the human being in a way that is going to be massively counterproductive in a world of increased unemployment. Mm -hmm. Because the thing that's bad about unemployment is the sense of shame, the sense of the scrapping, the sense of a waste, the sense of being um, un, un, uh, yeah, unable to be useful or productive within a community or within a, within a, a day. And I think what we have done, we shouldn't flatter ourselves <laughs> too much, but what this movement has done in, in really rightly saying that all work has dignity, 
has come really close to a line where uh, that that we should not cross, which is if you are not working, you do not have dignity, mm -hmm. right? And people have dignity by the fact that they are image bearers, Amen. as Tripp said, by the fact that they um, are made in the likeness of God, whether they are in the womb or on their deathbeds. And so we need to, we need to be very clear about the way that language functions in our mm -hmm. discourse and be prepared for uh, an increasing number of people who experience technological unemployment or disruption and are asking fundamental questions about their own sense of worth. Mm. Um, and we, we, we don't want to make that worse. Yeah. Well, and I might tag on to that. If we are created to work and there is not a traditional um, or even disrupted untraditional job available, then how do we help people start to redefine work in other ways? Um, and so, while people need to make incomes, there can be work that is unpaid that um, allows them to fulfill their um, creational mandate. And so that's why I think there might be some radical rethinking of income solutions around work. I would point out that Adam and Eve didn't get a paycheck, but they worked. Yes. Um, that wasn't, so I, I think I was talking to, to David uh, Gill um, earlier, and uh, he brought up this point, is that I think we conflate work with, um, you know, paying job a lot. Like, mom's work, it's not, there's purpose and meaning and all those kind of things in what they do. I will not be writing an AI to replace a mom, right? So I, I don't think, I think that we shouldn't conflate the two. I think there is a money problem, and we can talk about that, but there is a meaning and a purpose problem, too. And like work does not equal paycheck. I think that that's, we need to kind of, that's the theological kind of barrier that we need to break down, I think. Yeah, we, in our work in Pittsburgh, we talk about this and, and I think we borrowed language that, that Tom Nelson put forth a while ago, which is very helpful, which work is, is contribution before compensation, right? Or contribution before remuneration, depending upon. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, that must be done, that will not be compensated. Um, and and people are doing it. it. Could be the student. It could be the retiree. You know all of those roles. Um, let's jump into another question now. Um, I like this one. Trip is someone who's on the cutting edge of navigating two authority structures: dataism and theism. How do you negotiate between the two? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I think that uh, first of all, there's an infinite num amount of data, right? There's an infinite number of facts in the world. So. When someone says, well, I'm just going to let the data speak for itself, that's, of course, nonsense. Um, I mean, it is, right? So uh, another, a good example of where we let the data speak for itself and it was wrong um, would be uh, there's, there's a lot of AI and machine learning algorithms to try and predict recidivism in um, mm -hmm. inmate populations, for instance. Um, and, uh, you know, it, we would give it all the data that we had on, you know, these these human beings that were in prison and we try to predict, are they gonna commit a crime or should we let them out now? Or do we need to keep them in for a little bit longer? Um, and then very clearly it became clear that you were getting penalized if you were African American, for example. Mm. Um, and you know, if you were a man or woman or white or black, it would treat you differently. Wow. It would predict different things. That's based on the data, and I think that that's, it's very clear that our theology should come top down and say, no, we're not going to do that, hmm. right? Our, we are not going to use that data. That is wrong data that's predicting something that we're not okay with theologically. And I think that's most people, even non-Christians, I think that's their instinct, right, is to say, no, that's not right. We can't do that. And so I think your theology always comes first. You may not admit that, but it always comes first. Great. Um, <clears throat> This one was directed to Missy. Most agree something needs to be done, but few are actually doing something. Um, do you have examples of those who are doing something you can share? Um, and, and we can open that up to the rest of the panel, and I actually have a couple I could as well, but go ahead, Missy, give it a, give it a I shot. I know Lisa is starting in Pittsburgh, an area, uh, the Good Works, um, in, uh, you can tell more about it in a minute, but little things. I think people are starting to have the conversations, starting um, to think about how to meet people's needs, starting to put forth um, new economic theories. I have, I have not received any 
radical, big, uh, in this questionnaire I sent out, I did not receive any radical, big, we've got the answer solution. Um, I, I agree. I think it's. I think we're at the front end of it, particularly in this movement. I think. I think there are th things being done. So we have to also go in. And I think you gave us a very good word, Missy, around. Uh, you know, we say in Pittsburgh, nothing gets global until it gets local, right? So what's going on in your own backyard? How do you pay attention to what's already happening and join it? We may not have to do new things. We may be required to pay attention to what's already happening and throw some, you know, oxygen into it. Um, the church is, has a massive kind of resource to be able to help initiatives that are already going on. Uh, we are getting ready to launch in Pittsburgh something called the Just Work Center because we believe work is a primary mechanism for kingdom justice in the world and it means that there are all kinds of people out there, everyday workers, who are not being attended to. So we're starting our research. It's, we're at the very front end of it. Um, there are a couple of other things I've come across very recently. I'm curious, Philip or Tripp, if you have any examples of, of how this is starting to play out practically. So um, I think the future is going to be ancient, and I think uh, Missy put a little bit on guilds on her slide, yeah. which is an ongoing email exchange that we've been having. Um, and I think, I think we're going to have to reimagine some form of um, some form of kind of group identity in a municipality around, um, around a set of skills or a craft that is both a way of amplifying the individual's voice mm -hmm. and protecting, uh, like sharing both upside and downside of this technological revolution in some way. And the guilds, the medieval guilds were uh, uh, trying to do something like that. And yeah. I think that's gonna be reimagined and there are different folks outside of the church using that model yeah. that's kind of interesting to me. Um, and we, but that's, those are our inventions. Those are our things so we can we can appropriate that uh, type of thing for the 21st century. But otherwise, um, I would say, really, um, yeah, be, being very attentive to the needs on the ground and what it's going to take to actually be a balm for people uh, and a, 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 a sort of support structure for folks as they experience this yeah. is crucial to my mind. You know, one thing we're starting to work through is how can we begin to um, systematically offer career counseling and abilities counseling, things like that. But in past major shifts, which of course they weren't of, of this magnitude, but new creative opportunities came up sure. for people to work. So we're really trying to define work, uh, even slightly different than you did, Lisa. We're trying to define work as not rest and not leisure. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing that's productive, that's not rest and not leisure? If we can start to get people to think about that, um, I mean, unloading my dishwasher's work. I hate unloading my dishwasher. Um, <laughs> but I also know a lot of folks are beginning to dabble in supporting and encouraging entrepreneurism. At the same time, the new generational data came out this week in the Wall Street Journal about the people under the millennials are appearing at this age to have the least entrepreneurial interest of any age group in a really long time. And I say I think getting involved in encouraging entrepreneurial movements and thinking is um, something we can be doing as well. Yeah. Um, I want to just end with a comment. We have about a minute left, and then I'll I'll give you a few announcements before we leave, um, and we can follow up with this panel in the in the breakout session. Um, I was in Indianapolis last week and had got to experience a really interesting. Uh, new thing, maybe it's being done elsewhere in the country, but it was the first time I saw it. And it's an incubator for the trades. Um, so a couple guys who started an HVAC company, bought a building, uh, an old building in a vulnerable community, they've refurbished it, and they're opening it up to you know, electricians and plumbers and craft, you know, craftsmen, home builders, contractors, and they're helping them to market their businesses and they're creating a physical space for them to come and office or have meeting spaces. There's a church meeting in this space. It's about a 30,000 square foot building. It's called Refinery 46 if you wanna check it out. Uh, I found it fa absolutely fascinating and I'm talking to the guys this week a little bit more about their, what they're doing. Um, I think we need to see more practical solutions like that emerge as well. And 
And I do think there are things going on out there. We just have to become aware of them. I heard about a couple really interesting ones, one up uh, Jay Mason shared with me in Milwaukee last night. So we'll talk more about this, but this is where I think our movement needs to be paying attention as we move forward. So thank you so much, Philip and Missy and Tripp. If you want to follow up with these folks, go to the breakout. Uh, that'll happen at 11. Um, <clears throat> just a few announcements as we move into the rest of our day. This is. Uh, the last sort of formal time will be together until 2.30. Um, there are workshop times from 11 to 12 and then from 1 to 2. So you have a little bit of time now before the next workshop. We are going to try and keep those workshops running right on time. So please get to the workshops that you want to attend on a timely basis. Um, at 2.30, uh, we have a really wonderful experience, something new for the summit uh, that we're, we're going to bring to you. Um, it'll be a time of worship and reflection um, as uh, to, to really integrate our learning through a different lens, not just the head, but a little bit more of the heart. And I'm, I'm excited to have Greg Thompson and Isaac Wardell to come and talk to us uh, and then lead us in some worship uh, using a project that came out uh, last year, about a year ago, called the Porter's Gate Worship Project. If you're not familiar with it, you will be at 2.30, so you do not want to miss this session. Lunch will be served in this room from 12 to 1, uh, and you can come and hang out and visit with your friends. Um, at 4 o'clock, we'll adjourn the day, um, but at 4.30, there is a special feature film that's being offered by one of our sponsors and, and partners that you can come back and watch that we invite you to do if you're so interested. So that's a little bit of the lay of land for the day. Um, everything's on the app, so if you haven't downloaded the app yet, please do. That's where all the information is. And uh, go out and learn a lot. There's a lot of great workshops to to. to to visit and learn from and engage. We hope they're highly collaborative. We want this to be a, a rich learning environment for everyone here. So thank you for your attention this morning, and we'll see you back here at 2.30.